This episode is sponsored by our friends at White Charts. Taxes, they're inevitable, but minimizing your client's tax burdens is a key part of your role as a financial advisor. If you're tired of the headaches from manual calculations, spreadsheets, and juggling different software during the portfolio transition process, then we just the Y Charts update for you. Y Charts has released its new transition analysis tool. With this new feature, you can automate the many time consuming tasks typically associated with this part of the proposal process. This tool lets you, the advisor, easily get insights into a client's current positions, cost basis, gains, losses, and tax implications, making transitions smoother. Not only that, but clients can also adjust portfolio allocations in real time, building trust and collaboration with their advisors. Click on the link in the show notes to start your free Y Charts trial so you can explore this new tool today. And don't forget, get 20% off your initial Y Charts professional subscription when you start your free Y Charts trial and tell them I sent you. Eva, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Where do we find you today? I'm calling from my house in San Francisco. Are we going to get a appearance by GP, your, uh, your animal running around? Yeah, he's out for a walk today. Wait, what does he go by? Does he go by general partner or GP? He goes by the general. <laughs> Depending on the mood he's in. For listeners, what kind of dog is this? So I've got a mini Labradoodle, about 25 pounds, Auburn hair. Beauty. So this can be fun. We are 500 episodes in. We've never really done one on the topic today and figured you'd be the perfect person to chat about it, which is this topic of litigation finance. Would that be the right way to say the majority of how you got started? I know you guys are doing some other things now. Why don't you give us a 101? Let's talk about the basics. What is this for the investors out there? A little overview and then we'll dig in deep. Yeah. So litigation finance for folks who are not familiar with it is the practice of investing in lawsuits. If the lawsuit is successful, then you get paid. And if the lawsuit is unsuccessful, then you don't recover your principal. So it's a type of investing that's been around for about 20 years in the United States. And then previously uh, was more common in Europe as well as in Australia, primarily jurisdictions where People were used to lawsuits being financialized. So in the UK, for instance, if you lose your case, you actually have to pay for the other side's costs and fees. And so litigation finance emerged early as a way of sort of hedging your bets to make sure that your case is good, but you weren't going to be on the hook with a lot of downside risk if the case wasn't successful. I was going to say, can you distinguish this? Because for those non-informed out there, including myself, you hear the terms bat around the legal word, like lawyers take on cases for contingency. Is this something totally different? Is this the same? Is it a cousin? It's very similar to lawyers taking cases on contingency. So lawyers were in some sense, the original litigation funders. A lawyer might take on a portfolio of a hundred personal injury cases and make $150,000 on each one except that some of them will lose, in which case you'll make zero. But the problem is that only certain types of lawyers take cases on contingency. So if you're a lawyer and you only work on five cases per year and they're commercial matters, they're a lot more complicated, you work for a respectable white shoe law firm, then you're not about to just go and take your five cases on contingency because that might make a huge difference to how your profits look at the end of the year. So that's really where litigation finance comes in. Two thirds of the types of cases that my firm LegalS works on, commercial cases, which means they're breach of contract, business torts. And then one third are cases traditionally done by contingency lawyers, things like employment, class action, civil rights, workers' rights. And even in the cases of lawyers taking cases on contingency, they're paying a huge amount out of pocket for costs that they otherwise really shouldn't be spending as an investment matter. And so a litigation funder might come in and say, okay, you put in your time for free, but what we can do is we can pay for the expert costs, we can pay for the deposition transcripts, and we'll take care of all of the out-of-pocket, whereas you just put in your work and co-invest alongside us in the form of time. Maybe just walk me through traditionally a very generic case from the early days. What's the origin story timeline? You guys got started when? 2020? So our firm was actually founded in 2016. Oh, man, you've been around for a little bit. Okay, 2016. 
Yeah, we used to be the new kid on the block and now we're one of the legacy players. So my co-founder, Christian, and I started the company in 2016 when we were undergrads at Harvard, dropped out of Harvard to take the company through Y Combinator. And very originally, it wasn't even a litigation finance play. I mean, litigation finance is a pretty off the run asset class. It's not something that 20 year olds would really come up with. So we got into Y Combinator with our technology intending to build a legal analytics platform. And while we were at Y Combinator, the general counsel at Y Combinator pulled us aside and said, you know what you should do instead? If you have this live updating bird's eye view of all the state and federal trial courts, you should take that information and use it for investment purposes. So we kind of considered that, thought it wasn't such a good idea. We had no idea how to raise a fund, but then eventually over the course of the summer, he talked us into it. So in 2017, a full year later, we ended up raising our first $10 million fund to invest in 30 something cases. That fund was incredibly unlikely, but surprisingly it did really well. And then we were able to raise a $100 million fund in 2019 and then a $300 million fund in 2021. Today, the firm manages around a billion dollars of assets across a couple different asset classes, litigation, bankruptcy, and government receivables. And litigation is still our flagship strategy. We have most of our assets in litigation finance. And lo and behold, it's been eight years. Perfect. That's a great overview and helpful Let's stick with litigation finance for a little bit. Walk us through a generic case or a generic way that this could be an actual one you guys have done. It could be just names redacted, but how one might work. It could be early days. It could be recent, but from the initiation of the potential case, how you sift through, how you screen, how you find these all the way through how it actually works as well. So the best way to understand how litigation finance works is to use an example that people are very intimately familiar with if you've ever sold a business before, which is an earnout case. We see a lot of earnout cases. I mean, there's only a few types of contracts that people enter into frequently. You have sales contracts, buying equipment. The equipment could be faulty. You could have joint venture contracts. Let's say two businesses decide to work together on doing something, right? Releasing a new skateboard brand. And then finally, you have acquisition agreements. So acquisition agreements are extremely common and they're often very fraught. Being in litigation finance has taught me to never do business with anybody because it could always go wrong. And just to focus in on this acquisition earnout example, we see a lot of cases in the earnout category because earnouts are so subjective. The most common earnout agreement kind of goes like this. You know, your company buys my company and if I make this amount of revenue, then I'll get 1 million. And then if I make this amount of revenue, then I'll get 5 million. And then if I make this amount of revenue, then I'll get 10 million. But the problem is that after you acquire my company, you might take away my resources so that I have trouble even hitting the first milestone. Or, you know, if I bring in this much revenue, it might get misclassified. And so even though I know I brought in at least 10 million, it's now been misclassified and sent to another department. And so now I'm not being paid my earn out. So in these types of situations, not only do you have a business owner who has sold their business and so doesn't have a lot of cash on hand, but they also don't have their earn out. And so they might find an attorney and say, I know I'm entitled to be paid this $10 million, but they're just refusing to pay me. I need to file a lawsuit. And usually when a plaintiff goes into a litigation, they don't know what litigation is like. The best plaintiffs are not serial plaintiffs. This is their first and only experience with litigation, and all they know is that something really wrong has happened to them, and they want to correct it. So they might go to the random lawyer down the street, and then that lawyer might refer them to a commercial litigation attorney, and then they might file a complaint. So unfortunately, litigation doesn't work exactly the way it does in the movies, where after you file a complaint, you go and have a trial the very next day, and then the judge decides whether you get your money or not. Unfortunately, it's actually a fairly prolonged process between two, three, sometimes even four years, whereby the defendant has the opportunity to file a motion to dismiss, a motion for summary judgment, and then just to try and kick the case out at multiple points in time before you even get to trial. 
So the plaintiffs often have fatigue, maybe a year down the line, where they've been paying their attorney every single month. And that's really where we might find them, we being legalist. So what Legalist does is we crawl state and federal court dockets and we look for these turning points in a case that indicate that a case is going well. So there are 81 million civil cases filed every year in the United States. That and can't most be of right. Them, that uh, can't it's true. be right. Are you serious? I mean, most of them are not valuable. So most of them are small claims. A lot of them are mortgage foreclosures, and then a lot of them are collections cases. I mean, you could have a single person who's got like 10 collections cases against them. So it's not necessarily all valuable commercial litigation, but there is a lot of commercial litigation. So we crawl through all of those cases and we look for commercial litigation that has passed a turning point that indicates that someone, usually the judge, has looked at the case and said, you know, it's not bad. Please proceed. And that's really the point at which we reach out to them. So when we reach out to them, we'll reach out to them and say, you know, congratulations on surviving your motion for summary judgment. You might be gearing up for trial. You might be figuring out how you might pull together hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars to pay for an expert witness to testify at trial. We can help. And we do this on just a few hundred thousand cases per year out of the tens of millions that are filed. And to go back to our business earnout example, that could come as a welcome relief for them at a time when they've exhausted all of their savings pursuing this lawsuit. And just to say another thing about litigation finance, everyone is familiar with this concept that insurance companies systematize the defense of litigation. So if your insurance company is paying for your litigation, then they know which attorneys to use. They know how much it should cost. They will tell you when it's time to settle because they've seen a million cases like this. And that really doesn't exist very often for the plaintiff side. And so that's really what litigation finance does. It's the mirror image of insurance defense. We will take a look at the case and we'll say, oh my gosh, your lawyer has been billing you way too much money. Like you've only advanced through the very early stages of the case. There's no reason you should have paid this much. Or we might say, you know, your case is only worth $5 million at best. You really can't be spending more than $500,000, a million to litigate the case. Any more than that, and the attorney is overcharging you. So we come in, we put together a defined budget. We put together defined milestones, at which point it makes sense to spend the rest of the budget. And then, of course, we take a lot of risk alongside the plaintiff that the case will be successful. Because if it's not successful, then they don't actually have to pay back any of the legal fees that we paid. So let's just assume that this fictional business owner sold their company and then managed to get litigation funding. A big part of what litigation funding does as well is help them to assess how likely the case actually is to win and for what amount. So by the time that it gets to us, it's usually survived major dispositive motion hurdles. So it's pretty likely to get something. But that something can range from 1 million, the first hurdle, to 10 million, which is what the plaintiff thinks they deserve. And a big part of our underwriter's job, and we have four attorneys who are dedicated to underwriting on staff, a big part of their job is figuring out, well, did you actually meet the milestone for the $1 million payment? Did you actually meet the milestone for the $5 million payment? And a big part of whether the case will ultimately settle or go to trial is how big the gap in expectations are between the plaintiff's expectations and the defendant's expectations. A lot of times the defendant knows that they're going to have to pay something. They just think that one, it's better, better for them to delay it. They can make money if they spend the money elsewhere today and then pay tomorrow rather than paying today and not having that money to invest in the business tomorrow. And then two, they might think, I agree that you're owed one or even five, but there's no way I'm going to pay you 10. And I might as well withhold the one or the five until we actually get this whole thing resolved. Otherwise, you're going to hold on to the five and still hold out for 10. So a lot of times in litigation, you know, we can help the plaintiff really come to terms with how much they can expect to get in the case itself. And Usually when it comes time to settle, we've all kind of arrived at a consensus on what the claim is actually worth. 
Wow, that was a great overview. So give us some baseball statistics of this funnel of millions of potential cases. How many are you guys doing per year? How many do you guys end up winning? What cut do you guys take? How do the stats break down? Yeah. So our team takes 5,000 phone calls per year with attorneys who are interested in funding. And every year we, in, we make between 100 and 200 investments. So it's still a lot of investments. Each of our funds is highly, highly diversified with fund three on track to have more than 250 investments in it across a thousand plus cases. And our win rate at the end of the day is around 75%. Now, you might be wondering, you guys are so good at this and your returns are so good. Why is your win rate only 75%? And when investors ask us this, I think it, it always shows, which is a good thing, that they haven't been involved in much litigation. Because if you've been involved in litigation, then you know that there is just a measure of idiosyncratic risk that it's impossible to get rid of and that you have to price into how you do your investments. A lawyer that we work with always says, you know, if the jury likes you or feels that it's fair for you to win, they'll find a way to drape the law over you such that you get something, no matter what the technical merits of the case are. And we found this to work in the opposite direction as well, where even if someone has a great case on the merits, if the judge or the jury just takes one look at them and is like, oof, I, I, don't, think, I don't think they did any of the work, they seem lazy, then they will get nothing. And so for that reason, you know, we try to be as accurate as possible in our determination. And our win rate is based on if we made money on the investment, not if the underlying case wins. But I think a 75% win rate is already really, really good for the industry that we're in. What does the funnel look like to the majority of your cases that you guys take on, go all the way through the full process of going to in front of a judge? Do most of them get settled before that or how's it work? So about two thirds of our cases settle and then the other one third go to trial. That is a higher trial rate than the average. But I actually think that the average statistic that you hear, which is that 90% of cases settle, reflects sometimes the fact that the plaintiff doesn't want to settle, but they've just run out of money. And so now they actually have to settle. And so what litigation funding does is it gives plaintiffs the optionality. Now, I'm not going to lie, you know, when we underwrite a case, we usually underwrite it for a 10 to 1 damages to investment ratio. So if we invest 1 million, we're expecting the plaintiff to make 10 million. But not all plaintiffs hold out for the 10 million, even if they think the 10 million is what they deserve. So like I mentioned, they might get fee fatigue from the fees, but even if the fees are taken care of, they might just get litigation fatigue. Litigation is a hugely draining process. You have to basically relive the worst thing that someone ever did to you every day for like five years. And if they get litigation fatigue, then they might say, you know what, let me just settle this for five. Legalists will get three and then I'll walk home with two and I'm okay with that. So we usually target roughly the same as a contingency lawyer, 30, 40% of the case, but it's not often, but it does happen that plaintiffs will settle for less than we know the case to be worth because they just want out. As you sift through these cases, are you reaching out to the actual plaintiff or like the lawyers or what? So lawyers are primary point of contact. Lawyers are repeat players. When we first started, we were reaching out to lawyers cold and just saying, hello, your case is going really well. Would you like to talk? But at this point in our fund's life, I mean, it's been eight years, we have spoken to most of the lawyers that do mid-level commercial litigation finance, and most of them know us. Either they know us or someone in their firm has worked with us on a case. And so most of our conversations these days are actually warm. It seems like, if I had to guess, that it's kind of this single digit to maybe low double digit potential outcome cases. Is that y'all's sweet spot or am I totally off? Is it the range is much wider or much narrower? Yeah, exactly. So we tend to focus on cases that require somewhere between 500,000 and a million of funding, which means the damages that we're shooting for are somewhere in the single digits to low double digits. Who are your competitors in this world? So we are a little bit different from some of the other litigation funders. The most famous litigation funder is a publicly traded company known as Burford. The main difference between us and Burford is that 
Burford tends to focus on very large disputes. So most of their investments are five, usually 10 million and up. And the way that most litigation funders were started really reflects that. So you have these high powered, really, really smart commercial litigators who say, hey, litigation finance isn't so hard. Me and my buddy are going to spin off and then we're going to start a commercial litigator. The big problem with some of these types of funds and the reason why it's been kind of a mixed bag in terms of which funds are successful and which funds are not is that you're taking a huge amount of binary risk on each individual case. So if you only have 10 cases in a portfolio and you've put $10 million into each one, a couple of them not doing so well could kill your returns for the fund. So by contrast, we haven't done that. In our $100 million fund, instead of doing 10 cases, we did over 100 cases. And at that point, you're not really looking at whether each individual case is successful as long as overall you keep your win rate more or less the same. And this kind of law of large numbers approach allows us to take the idiosyncratic nature of any individual lawsuit and de-risk it by putting it into a portfolio. So diversification is really, really a good thing in the litigation finance space. Modern portfolio theory 101, you need enough bets, plays out. I mean, I think certainly some of the most successful businesses and investors in the world understand that, whether not to compare you to a casino, but angel investors and investors of all walks, like you need enough diversification. So in-house, you guys have been around going on near a decade now. Talk to me a little bit about the analytics, the money ball side of this. We have this AI revolution everyone's all hot and bothered about. I imagine over the past decade-ish, you guys have developed a fair amount of interesting insight into what tends to work and what tends not to. It's like how OkCupid back in the day used to publish all these interesting, quirky ideas. Is there anything in particular that you guys have teased out? I do think that when people think about the money ball of litigation, they are simplifying it quite a bit. So when we first started building the legal analytics product, Christian and I were really excited because we thought that we had figured out which cases, or sorry, which lawyers are better than all the other lawyers. And then we went in and actually looked at their win rates and what types of cases their win rates were based on. And we found out they were all collections attorneys. So they were all getting default judgments against debtors for like $100. And so therefore their win rates were better than everyone else's win rates. And that's where I think the danger really comes in, in overgeneralizing with legal analytics. If you have a lawyer that only takes on the hardest cases, they might be like a, a doctor that's like a heart surgeon, as opposed to a, a pediatrician or a family doctor, right? Yeah, more of their patients die, but they also take on the very hardest cases. Not to mention the fact that at the really complex commercial litigation level, most cases settle or if they are moving towards trial to begin with, it means that something has gone really wrong because their job is to settle the case. Their job is to arrive at a resolution that doesn't involve going to trial. There are really three things that we underwrite for in a litigation finance case. There is liability, which is will the case be successful? There's damages. If it's going to be successful, how much is it going to be successful for? And then there is collectability. So if the case is successful, are you actually going to be able to get the defendant to pay, especially to pay that amount? So you see a lot of these cases that win billion dollar verdicts at trial, but the defendant has no way to pay for it, or they're going to file bankruptcy and then get out of paying the vast majority of it. So collectability is a really big factor, and it's actually just as important as the other two. What our tech is historically really, really good at is it's really good at weeding out the cases that just have no liability to stand on whatsoever. The next stage, the damages stage, actually has to be done by human underwriters, and it cannot be eliminated from the underwriting process because it's so case specific. So to go back to our earnout agreement, whether your company or the entrepreneur did the work to earn a $1 million earnout a $5 million earnout or a $10 million earnout. It's so fact specific that it really can't be money balled. And then finally, the collectability. This is something that our tech does do initial screens for. For instance, we don't really fund cases against individuals. We don't look for cases against individuals. Individuals are really rarely collectible. 
But when it comes down to whether a private company in particular has revenue, has profit, that kind of thing is not very public. And it's really down to the discretion of the underwriters to do research from a wide variety of data sources. What we have learned is that damages is the area where litigation funders get it wrong the most often. You have reasonable damages, which the defendant agrees on, and then you have your wildly speculative lost profits damages. So to break down the legalese a little bit, you know, let's say that you and I go into a joint venture to make skateboards. I spend a bunch of money buying wood to make skateboards. Those are my actual costs that I expended in pursuit of this joint venture. And you failed to make your design for the skateboards or market for the skateboards or whatever. So if I were to sue you for not performing on our joint venture, I could probably recover the cost of the wood that I bought for the skateboards. But a lot of litigation funders and a lot of lawyers who encourage their plaintiffs with these really wild damages propositions are like, no, if you guys had done the skateboard venture, you would be a billionaire. You would have made a billion dollars. It would have been such a great skateboard venture. And so that's what's known as lost profits. So if you factor in lost profits, then yeah, there are tons of billion dollar cases that end up settling for pennies on the dollar. We have this joke internally with our underwriters that if we were to add up all the billion dollar cases that came to us for funding, it would be greater than the world GDP. It's like everybody thinks they have a billion dollar case if only this thing had happened. So that's really what we've learned from underwriting and how we integrate the three parts of what makes for a good case into our underwriting process. Now, moving a little bit on to the technology component. So as you probably know, traditional artificial intelligence was fine-tuned to do very specific tasks. And so the way that we did it was we were looking for signs that a case had survived major dispositive motion hurdles. Now, what generative AI is good at doing is it's good at reading and generating text on kind of a live ad hoc basis instead of being very specific to what you're looking for. And so we've started to integrate it at the tail end of our funnel when we're reaching out to the folks that have actually survived major motion hurdles. So that instead of saying, please contact us given that you survived a motion for summary judgment, we can actually have all this information about which causes of action survived the summary judgment emotion, and we can opine on what that means for it, the case. So that's been a big boon for us in terms of actual outreach. But if we were to run LLMs on all 81 million civil court cases, it would probably be too expensive. And maybe we'll do that once the costs come down. You guys started out litigation finance, but have mentioned you also focus on a couple newer areas. We'd love to hear what they are. Are they somewhat adjacent? Or are they totally different as well? Yeah. So Legalist manages three different strategies that are in separate vehicles that have different risk and return profiles. After we raised Fund 3 for our litigation finance fund, we began branching out into a bankruptcy strategy. So within bankruptcy, we make investments into small debtor and possession loans. So debtor and possession loans are a special type of loan within bankruptcy where you come in after the bankruptcy is filed ahead of all the other creditors. It has what's known as a priming lien. And within debtor and possession financing, it's very rare to see dip loans offered at the lower end of the market because most of the folks in distress are doing the huge JCPenney, Toys R Us bankruptcies, whereas we tend to focus on the small asset-backed businesses that are usually moving towards liquidation, but want one last chance to try and restructure. The Government Receivables Fund is actually spun out of a conversation that we had with one of our LPs, a university endowment that approached us at one of our AGMs. So the investor basically said, we have this other fund that we're invested in. It does government receivables lending, really cool asset class kind of a 90-day short-term paper strategy where you get paid directly by the government. You lend to companies that are owed money by the government, either for work performed on contracts or for grants, and you get paid really, really quickly. But the catch is that as soon as the companies are large enough, they don't want to pay really high rates. They can go get a regular bank line 
And so this other funder is having trouble finding enough opportunities to actually scale up their business. The opportunities that they are finding are just enough to replace their old ones. And so they're trying to reduce their cost of capital rather than scale the strategy itself. And so he basically thought with our technology, what legalists could do is scale by constantly finding new contracts that were being awarded that were published in some kind of government database and thereby constantly be replacing the contractors that no longer need receivables financing with new ones. And so far, that's proven out to be exactly the case. We launched that strategy with $100 million in April of 2022. Two years later, we have around $230 million in the strategy. And it's been a, a really, really good third strategy for us. How often are you guys contacting a potential partner? It could be on litigation finance, on this government receivables. Is this like a hot series A round where there's like four other competitors, the legalists, or like you guys are often the only one? What percentage of the time are you battling other players in this ecosystem versus no, you're the white knight? So we specialize in types of alternative credit where there are no competitors. And the asset classes themselves are so little known that it's very unlikely for one of these lawyers or government contractors to be getting other calls from other folks in these spaces. I mean, I will say that money is fungible, right? So a government contractor always has the ability to say, no, thank you to government receivables financing. I'm going to take out a second mortgage on my house. Or they always have the ability to say, I can just fund it out of my personal savings. But what we do is we identify these assets that other people, specifically banks, might not be able to lend against because it requires some type of specialized underwriting. And then we say, we can lend against that. The catch is that there is an explanation and education gap that needs to be bridged in the beginning. So we have to explain to them, this is how government receivables financing works. This is how litigation financing works. And that takes a lot of time. But we've been big believers in creating your own market from the very beginning. So it's the kind of thing that we have learned to work around. So I don't know that I've ever heard, and I don't run in these circles so much, so maybe it's just my bad hearing, of someone going through Y Combinator, Deal Fellows, it's been like a investment fund style offering. Are you guys unique in that? Or I guess you started in slightly a different focus. Is that something that you've ever seen before? Because it's great. My traditional world, I think it's wonderful, but uh, traditionally, it's not something I've seen. There is one other one. It's called Theorem LP. But I think that the reason why most fintech companies don't become asset managers is because asset management is a very slow and difficult way to grow. And if we had not managed to raise fund one and fund two, we probably would have had to take venture funding. We probably would have paired that venture funding with a debt facility. And then we probably would have tried to originate a lot of shoddy litigation finance deals in order to grow our origination, in order to meet the returns of those venture investors. And it would have sent us on a negative flywheel that would have not been good for our business. So I actually think that you're going to see a lot more fintech originators become vertically integrated like us. Not to mention being a money manager is a huge pain in the ass. It's a lot of regulators. We love you regulators, those that are listening, but it's the most watched and regulated industry, which uh, is good because there's a lot of sketchiness that goes on. Let's talk about the investment side. So I assume most of your LPs at this point are institutional. Do you take individuals? Are those long gone? We have a lot of RIAs. We rarely take individuals. I mean, litigation finance is particularly attractive to RIAs and family offices because it's the one type of alternative credit that is capital gains rather than ordinary income. Interesting. All right. When you say RIAs, just to dig in because you mentioned it, is it on any platforms or they just invest and it goes across their clients? They subscribe. I mean, family office is very obvious you know, use case for you guys, but it's really interesting about the RIA side. How do you traditionally I mean, interact? I we're on Fidelity. Oh, wow. 
Okay, that's super cool. All right, so you're talking to an RA, talking to a family office, talking to an institution, talking to Bezos, somebody with a lot of capital. You've kind of described the whole inner workings and guts of this operation, but talk to it as someone who may be an LP. What's the pitch there? I think that LPs like litigation finance primarily because it's uncorrelated. So you have all types of investments that used to be uncorrelated to each other. You could have a 60-40 stock bond portfolio, but at the end of the day, stocks and bonds all move in the same direction now. And very few types of funds are truly uncorrelated from a first principles perspective, and litigation is one of them. The reason that litigation finance is uncorrelated is because assuming that all the defendants are collectible, which is something that we underwrite for very closely, the merits of an individual litigation determines whether or not you get paid. Nothing about the company's fundamentals. And so give me some broad expectations. We've made over 400 investments. We have over 130 realizations, and we have a 75% success rate. The way to think about litigation finance is as a shorter duration private equity vehicle. So we have a five to seven year private equity like vehicle, but where the investment period is only two and a half years. You got me interested and I want to invest. Is it like a private equity style lockup situation? How do I think about it? It's a drawdown private equity style fund. Two and a half year investment period, two and a half year harvesting period with two optional one year extensions. Half these private equity firms are like 15 years now. They'll they'll say they're like seven. And then like next thing you know, it's like 15 years. Okay. So more like five years. Talk to me about volatility. These are diverse bets. I get that they're not marked on like a daily sort of thing. How do I think about this? Is this more of like, I should think about this as in my alts bond bucket or where am I slotting this? Buckets is hard for the strategies that we run. People usually put litigation finance into alternative credit, opportunistic credit, absolute return. Those are the prominent categories. As an RIA, trying to think about how to talk to my clients when they see this on the line item from FIDO, litigation finance, it sounds a little, not scary, but it sounds like something not traditional. Okay, so we're kind of looking best of both worlds. What do you guys charge? Is there a uniform fee? Is it based on uh, AUM? What's this going to cost me? Just private equity, like two and 20. Okay, so big bucks. Good. Well, all right. What else do I need to know as an allocator? Do I invest across all three strategies? Is that the best way to do it? Is there like a master feeder to do that? Or should I start with litigation finance and move on to receivables and everything else? The strategies are really for different risk and liquidity profiles. So litigation finance, as I mentioned, is private equity like returns, private equity like vehicle. Government receivables is in a liquid quarterly redemption vehicle. As interest rates have come up, zero to five, does that help you guys? Does that hurt you guys? I'm trying to think. I imagine it would help you on the origination side because a lot of people are now, the cost of money is more expensive for them on how they might want to finance or you mentioned getting a mortgage or a second mortgage on and I'm like, yeah, not probably not as likely anymore. Is that helpful? Is it hurt? Litigation finance, we don't often charge with a floating rate component, but on government receivables, we do. I think interest rates coming up as a whole is just generally good for private credit, but less so for us because we are uncorrelated. I love playing devil's advocate, so I'm going to ask just a whole handful of random questions. If you look at where we are today, I imagine there's some young 20-something-year-old Harvard students listening to this saying, oh, I should go build this. This sounds like a great business. I also should raise a billion dollars. What sort of the future of this look like for you guys? As you look out to the horizon, as far as competition getting harder, are you guys thinking about moving into some other areas? Are there some developments in just technology or regulations that is causing you guys some excitement or indigestion? I don't know. What's the rest of 2024, 2025 look like for Eva and crew? I mean, I think that the issue with all of our strategies is that they're capacity constrained. Any kind of alternative credit at the end of the day is capacity constrained. There's only so many litigations in the world. There's only so many bankruptcies. There are a lot more government contractors, but even so, there's a finite number. It's not quite like the public markets where theoretically the market is uncapped. I think for us, the challenge that 
we've always had to balance is figuring out how to scale a strategy so that we can capture all of the alpha, but not scaling it beyond its carrying capacity. So on litigation finance, for instance, with our upcoming fund four, I think that we're probably starting to reach the limits of how large each strategy can get. And of course, that's also our moat, which is that if a strategy is small, you don't have as many people rushing in to trying to find a way to copy what you do. Each of our asset classes has players that are not that much larger than us at the forefront. So in government receivables, the largest fund in our space is only $2 billion. In litigation finance, the largest funds in our space, you know, in Take Burford, it's not like a massive market cap public company. It's like a mid-sized public company. And that, at the end of the day, is our limitation as well as our advantage. We normally ask the people on this pod at the end, what's been your most memorable investment? You can answer this two ways, that or you could answer it, what's been your most memorable case? It could be one that was a positive surprise. It could be one that was really painful and miserable, or it could just be a weird one where it was like the strangest possible type of litigation. Anything come to mind? So I can probably talk about this one because it got written up in the Boston Globe. So we funded a case back in the day, many years ago, which featured an ice cream sandwich company based out of Boston. And they were suing their ice cream manufacturer because they claimed that they had changed the formulation to make the ice cream itself less creamy. And I remember being so struck by this case because it really reminded me that all the things that we touch in our day-to-day lives are impacted in some way by the law and litigation. So if a manufacturer doesn't make ice cream to spec, that could be a litigation. We've had two separate litigations involving indoor trampoline parks. And when the second one came around, I was like, there cannot be a large enough market within indoor trampoline parks for there to be a second litigation case. But recently, we also had a second ice cream machine litigation. And I was like, how could there be two of these? This one, when they're like, look, it's too creamy. You know, (laughs) before it wasn't creamy enough. Now it's too creamy. We don't like it. Yeah, exactly. In the second one, it actually caused like indigestion. So it was much more serious than not being creamy enough. I'm making me hungry. It's almost lunchtime here. (laughs) Here's another one. This is a little bit different one. We usually, again, this is more of an investment question, but ask it in like, I don't know if there's such a thing as litigation finance conferences, but let's say you sit down with some PMs or people in your world. It could be lawyers, whatever, and having coffee, happy hour, whatever it may be. And you're talking about your world. And so it's kind of inside baseball, but like, what's a belief you have about this area of litigation finance? It could be in the investing side, it could be the operations that if you said out loud, most of your peers would shake their heads and say, no, Eva, she's a -a ding-a-ling. I don't believe that. What you're saying is wrong. Is there something that comes to mind? This applies for not just litigation finance, but we at the firm are not very big on brokers and we're not very big on conferences. So we really believe that it's like a matching problem. So you see this with the dating apps today. When you're on a dating app, they're reporting this right now about some of the major ones because they've monetized so heavily. The people that you're shown are never the ones that you want to be shown. And so similarly with brokers, bankers, and conferences, the people that are going, the people that the brokers are showing you, they're never the ones that you actually want to be working with. The purpose of creating a market like that is to erode alpha. So anytime you have a broker involved, you're creating an auction. And when there's an auction, there's a phenomenon that emerges, which is known as the winner's curse, which is that the person who wins when you have several people competing to win a deal is the most likely to be the one that's overestimating the worth of the fundamental asset. And so the only way to have consumer surplus here is to minimize producer surplus. And the purpose of a market is to really erode all of that surplus. Very thoughtful. It reminded me of M&A 
so often in the public markets, the problem when you get into companies buying other companies, it's very often value destroying for the acquirer because they often pay too much. It gets competitive and these megalomaniac CEOs start to empire build and say, I got to outbid for this. We got to have it. And then you have that problem where, yes, is an interesting purchase, but at what price and at what cost? That's thoughtful. Where do people find info? Where do they go? They want to check out what you guys are doing. They want to learn more about Eva in Legalist. What's the best spot? Legalist.com. Awesome. Eva, it's been a whirlwind tour. We would love to have you back in the future and here on your new ventures, your new funds. Congratulations on your success. Thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. 